right now is probably one of my favorite times in this industry because like when I started, you know, early 80s, it was about brands. It was Rolex, it was Cartier, it was Piaget. And now we're getting to this evolution where it's about the guy who's making it. It's going back to the F.P. Jorns and the Daniel Roths. And we're now starting to know, meet, and engage with watchmakers again. You know, the Melons. The Melons, We yep. get to meet these people who it's a personal passion. And it's becoming to me more about an obsession with the brand, but also more importantly with the guys behind it. And getting to know the people behind it, it's hard not to get sucked in. I mean, I've been lucky in my life. I've gotten the chance to go to a lot of manufacturers and like, I met the guys at Longa. And I know for a fact, the reason I love it so much is because I can picture being there at their desk, watching them do this stuff, being like, I could never possibly do that. And it's so cool. And just knowing that there's a guy over there spending all his days worried about making the best chronograph you ever want to see, just makes me smile every day. It's so cool. And like, you know, we, we I, I've certainly also been lucky. I, you know, met the head gem setter at Paddock. And, you know, just to talk about a recent release, it's amazing what goes into gem setting. It's something that, okay, we, we see jewelry pieces, we see jewelry in general, we, we see it. I truly did not have an appreciation until I got to Paddock's manufacturer. And it was one of those things where it's just like, you're meeting the guy who's selecting the stone that goes at the 830 position in the bezel of this <laughs> one watch. And it's, once you slowly put that together as a, as a consumer, as an industry insider, as somebody who likes what you're looking at, it just, it's, it's all encompassing. I mean, I, I met the guy who did the guilloche on the 5130 that I was wearing, like an insane level of touch. And I think that's so cool. Yeah, that's, that's so exciting. I mean, I'm, in a, I'm, a, I'm a baby in the industry compared to you guys. I know that, but I did have the, uh, the awesome opportunity to go to see IWC um, and to really get behind the scenes with them and, and see you know, the work that they put into every tiny detail, it blows you away. And, you know, like I always say, drink the Kool-Aid, but like that certainly made me drink the Kool-Aid because you, you, you see something like that from their perspective and, the, and the, um, the blood, sweat and tears that they put into all of that. And, you know, that's, that's what made me passionate right there. I mean, that, that, that started all over again for me, just seeing how much work goes into it. And then like, it gives you appreciation for the brand that you can't really get anywhere else because um, you know, you know, you, you can put a face to the people that are that are putting all that hard work into the watch that you get to wear every day. You know, people take that for granted when they walk in and they see it in a boutique and they buy it and they wear it for a while and they get rid of it. But you know, like when you're there in person and you see these people putting that work into it, and every watch passes through so many hands, and and there's so much quality control that goes into it. It's just it's, that makes it so addicting. And you know, uh, it, Schaffhausen in particular, just to uh, talk to your point to IWC is is a powerhouse. It's a 7,000 person town, which is small. And you have H. Moser and C, you have IWC, two huge brands. And to bring this into a little bit, well, for one, IWC, every one of their watches is actually hand finished. Every single case is hand finished, something I learned at the factory there. And I thought that was amazing. Now, you know, that's a brand that makes an unofficial amount of watches. And by unofficial, I mean about 100,000, you'd say, right? Right. So again, Schaffhausen houses H. Moser and C, which I believe we did get somebody asking our opinion on H. Moser. They did. Somebody dialed uh, in and wanted to know well, what we I, thought about it. I can say for sure I like the brand. That is my personal watch on the table. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's such this difference between a manufacturer like IWC making 100,000 watches and in the same town, a few blocks away, you have H. Moser making 1,500 watches. And it really is a small town, too. Super like small. It's not, it's You've not been there, city. too, haven't you? I've been there, town. but I mean, it's nothing compared to Glashute. Oh, oh I can't even. <laughs> Where well, it's a 2,000-person town, and you have now, like, 10 brands. But let's jump back to Moser for a minute. I love the brand. I even more love the people. Agreed. If you spend an hour on the phone with either one of the Melons, you will get sucked in because they just... You want to talk about passion. You want to talk about commitment to what they're doing. And again, they're young guys. 
They took over an old brand and they've just breathed life into it with sheer passion. And it comes from the dad. You know, they come from a family who's been in this. And I think to your point, a lot of this passion tends to get passed down and I'm seeing it happen right in front of my eyes. My son Mitchell, you know, just started working here, you know, six months ago. I'm going to call you my and horological every day dad. now he comes, you know, he's like online. And when I first sat down with him the first time, I was asking him, you know, what his favorite watch was. And he's like, you know, uh, 5170. I was like, what? You know what that is? He's like, oh, yeah, of course. I took a picture of it when I was at the museum and we did all this. And I was like, they really catch the bug and you don't even realize it. But it just it definitely permeates. And I think it happens with collectors, too. It's like you sit down and you start talking about, you know, my dad was all about chronographs. That was his specialty. He went to watchmaking school in the 50s and like loved his Omega chronographs and that was what he did. And every time I pick up a chronograph, it makes me think of my dad, That's so which cool. is so cool. So and cool. it's something that you forget how much. And now I'm watching my sons like I come home, he's stealing one of my watches. It's like the best feeling in the world when you can get that connection. And I think the collectors have that same thing. Once you go down the rabbit hole and you get into this and you realize what's behind it, it really does become a little bit addictive for sure. It really does. And we're so lucky here. Like, you know, I get looked at like I have three heads when I want to talk watches elsewhere. And, and you know, I can, I can, that's I can, I can, I can, I can, I can call you, I can call you. Yeah. And you know, it, it's, well, that's a good, are there like any quirks that just come along with every watch collector you bump into or watch enthusiast we're all you bump nuts. into? We're like, all what absolutely are, wait, nuts. If you had to like identify some of the unique quirks that are, that are exclusive to a watch collector, what do you think they would be? Uh, I don't know how much is exclusive, but I think collector is the key word. I have a lot of guys who love to collect watches, but they might also have cars or knives or cameras. Yep. A lot like of guys. They, they do mean, the everyday they carry dump, collect. right? They, they have like all the crazy stuff in their pockets, like <laughs> knives, whatever it may be. I think an appreciation of craft else. of some sort. Yeah. Um, and again, a lot of my guys, like I had a lot of guys who were vintage car guys. Yeah. And just love old cars, understand what goes behind them because there was a lot of similarities, especially if you go back 20, 30, 40 years ago with cars, they were boutique brands. There's not that much of that anymore. Right. Because it just got to be such a big business. You can't really do that we still have that in the watch business i mean we have these little brands that make you know a few hundred the grown are making level. what yeah 100 watches maybe on a good year it's it's, you know, it's amazing it's cool roman gautier 50 60 watches a year it, it's right. crazy when you talk about the scale and i think actually in um Tim did an interview with uh, Gautier actually, and uh, I think they were discussing the nuances actually with with cars and how they're not so much, you know, this this small boutique thing anymore. Granted, you have certain certain brands that are, but you're paying for them, and you know that's the case in watchmaking sometimes as well. You, you have your your Acrivias of the world; they're right. amazing. He makes twenty pieces a year. You're not going to get one. You're not <laughs> going to find one. You're not going to see one. You're not going to find an authorized dealer. But the fact that it exists is right. amazing. And he's able to do it still. And that's what we lost, I think, in a lot of other industries was yes. the crafts people who really did do super high end, super luxury, super passionate things either got swallowed up by the, the giants, be it in fashion, be it in cars, be it in anything. Um, there is still a lot of independence in this world. And I think part of it is, you know, you have to have that mindset. The, you know, we talk about collectors. Um, talk about watchmakers they're all little nuts I mean my dad was a little watchmaker I mean they're all little you know wired differently than we are um, and you have to be to have this kind of drive and passion and I think that comes through and it's addictive I mean it does become you know you can, it's hard not to bite into it. it it becomes a unfortunately I think all too often it becomes a what's next and I think uh, myself personally my collecting philosophy has been changing as uh, as I've gotten older, as I've been a little bit more selective with my watches in general, you know, it, it's it's changed from, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely buy that Seiko that's just a couple of hundred bucks. You know what, I'll buy that one too, and that one, and that one. And it's changed <laughs> to, hmm, I have 15 Seikos now. I wear them, but you know what? I want that Rolex, I want that Moser, I want that Omega. It, it, it's definitely changed to, 
quality uh, beyond quantity at this point. At least for me personally too, like I, I almost enjoy the hunt more than I do actually picking up the watch. I get that. So I like, getting... cause then as soon as I pick up that watch, I'm, I'm already looking for the next one because like the hunt is the best part because you just go through, you narrow it down to a category, but then like something else comes out and it blows your mind and then it opens it all back up again. And like, I'm happy to spend, you know, six months to a year figuring out what that watch is. And then once I get it, it's fantastic, but I'm already on to the next one. It's like a disease. Yeah, no, my favorite, I have the best job in the world because all I do all day is buy watches. And, <laughs> and I don't need to keep them. I just love, it's that hunt to find something cool. I mean, we bought a, an amazing, you know, Newman Daytona that, you know, I was working on for a while. And as soon as that thing popped up on my screen, I was like, oh my God, I have to have this watch. And, you know, that's the fun stuff. You know, the 5270 blues, the double split longas, you know, all those crazy that. pieces yeah. that, you know, you can go years without even seeing. And then when one comes up, it's just, you know, the excitement is crazy. That's one thing that I constantly remind myself is that the things that you and I and you and I see on a daily basis are absolutely ethereal to some collectors. It's something that every day I'm holding somebody's grail and that is such a feeling and I I love to say that it never gets old and some days I feel like it gets old but ultimately remind myself it never gets old. I was gonna say I've been doing this you know never really gets can't old. Can't tell you how long 37 years maybe and Armin, it doesn't I think, get old. I think you and I were talking about when I first walked in to to Watchbox and and I and I had uh, there was an array of Jorns in front of me and it blew my mind yeah because I'm like oh my god I've seen this watch a million times and, and, and uh, you know, on Instagram, wherever it may be, but like to see it in the flesh just blew me away. It's here now. And now it's like, you almost take it for granted because we have so much incredible stuff passed through this, this, this building. And, and, but like the end of the day, we really do get to see some special pieces and that's, that's what makes it so much fun. Yeah, it is hard. I mean, you do get numb to some of it. There's no <laughs> question about it. But every once in a while, you do take that step back and be like, oh, my God, that's so cool. And you know, it's so funny. You know, I, we're all wearing Rolex, you know, a, a huge, yeah, I have it. Yeah, exactly. very high production brand. I, yep. I can't not love Rolex. I, this is, uh, you know, other than my Moser, these are the two watches that I wear every day without without fail. It's one of the two. And you know what happens? I go, I look at my watch box. I say, eh, eh. yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, this is gonna be reliable. Oh, uh, what if I fall into a river? I, I'm not going to fall into a river, but either one of these, it's gonna be fine. You know, it, it's, it's, it's part, of the, part of the morning chore of choosing that's so much fun. And despite the fact that, you know, yeah, maybe Rolex is more produced than other brands. You know, maybe some people find it a little less special. I love my Air King. I, love my air king you love your deep sea and I you love, love my your sea. i love my no batman date. i mean it's funny because yeah. it's funny you say that because it is of all the brands that we carry it is the most common I yes mean, there's no question about it they're the far and away the biggest volume far and away thing but for whatever reason i've been wearing rolexes again since the late 80s and i'll I never not have one when i first got it i thought i was the coolest thing as a kid like my first rolex i was like and i've never not had a rolex and it's almost always my daily driver yeah, I'll switch off and I'll wear my paddocks and I wear other stuff, but it's like, I always wear my Rolexes and I beat the living crap out Same. of them. Same, doesn't thing. it make it hard to, to make an addition to your collection too? It Because you look at a Rolex and it's just so well-rounded and you can do anything with it that it makes it tough to add another piece into your collection. It was so funny when, well, this past Saturday, we were, we were uh, moving a few things, you and I together, yep. and uh, both wearing our watches, you know, and uh, you go, uh, oh, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna pause and take my watch off. And I was like, okay, fine, you wanna put it in my bag. It's, you know, totally cool. And, you know, we're moving a desk and we're carrying it down a flight of stairs. And you're like, oh man, you, you got me feeling a type of way. You're wearing your watch, <laughs> I'm not wearing mine. And it's like, yeah, it's a Rolex, it'll take it. It'll take whatever I throw at it. Anything you can do, it can do. Anything you can do, it can do. That's very no, true. And I never, I never take my watch off. Same. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I sleep with it. It's part of who I am. So yeah. I love that part of it. And it does become, when if I ever do take it off, it feels weird. I yeah. can't. Feel naked. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no. Yep. I'm missing something. I know that. Now, I always have a nice tan line in the summer. Yeah, very, very strong. strong. Can't love wait for the my uh, I'm not the there yet. <laughs> <laughs> now we uh, so we all love Rolex. There's a Rolex on the table. There's a Rolex on our wrist. But one thing that I think keeps collectors coming back are the the brands that 
or the brands or watches that you don't really often think about. The perfect example is Chopard in the LUC collection. This watch is awesome. It's an eight day regulator with a date and a 24 hour, uh, 24 hour register. It's awesome. Is it everybody's cup of tea? Absolutely not. You know, it's got a weird complication. Regulator, a little bit strange. But it's meant for somebody. Somebody's gonna love this. You have a really cool Sunray dial guilloche and all for less than $20,000. I mean, the quality of, I mean, I love the LUCs. The quality is unbelievable. I think, again, the problem becomes is, you know, mainstream collectors, a lot of them are like, you know, I don't want to show part. They're not even looking. Yeah. If you look at this and put it next to a lot of the other pieces, I think you're a thousand percent right. I mean, fit, finish, dollar value. It's a spectacular thing. And it's, it's cool looking and distinctive. I love that. I love watches that, you know, don't look like other things. The ones I picked out are, again, I'm the chronograph guy, uh, you know, blame my dad. Double split. Um, this to me is the silliest chronograph there ever is. I love <laughs> Longa. I love... Uh, the fact that they needed to make a double split because, you know, of course, a split chronograph wasn't good enough. And I mean, it's just a hockey puck on your wrist. I love big watches, obviously with my deep sea. Um, but I just think it's everything. That suits do. you. That Doesn't elevates that suit your look. Yeah. It's I mean, that really, a watch. it's a beast of a watch. And I mean, it's one of the coolest movements you'll ever see. It really is. You look like, you look at that movement and it looks like you could fall into it for a mile and a half. Yeah. I mean, it's a little city. I mean, it really is. And I mean, it's just... It's such a piece that they just raised the bar on Chronos, in my opinion. <laughs> and like, I just know, like, my dad would appreciate that. You're that certainly watch, not gonna forget it's on your wrist. I'm not gonna forget that's <laughs> on my wrist. I don't forget this is on my wrist. <laughs> that watch raised the bar on Chronos and raised the bar on finishing, I yeah. think. But the, the finishing on the Datagraph is one of the things that made me appreciate what finishing really means. And I, I, I think that, you know, between the German silver, between their level of finishing, it's incredible. You can't, you can be anybody in the world and you cannot argue that movement. And the thing is, is amazing is like, when you go there and literally they're lined up on a table and there's, you know, a young lady sitting there and a lot of them are really young because the brand is not very old. It's not like going to Paddock where you have these guys who have been there 40 years. I mean, what, you know, 94 at the most? The company, exactly. The company hasn't been there for 20, more than 25 years. So you have a lot of young kids and literally kids and they're sitting there for hours just polishing parts. Yeah. You know, well, I like that. every single part, top, bottom. They probably, put them together yeah. twice. I mean, it's unbelievable when you see that. And as and, a result of that, they probably like they, they break the mold from Paddock a little bit, and they're larger watches too. And I think I said that the last time we got together it was like, oh yeah, I, I like that you know they're not you're afraid to go big. Too. They're not afraid to go big. The other thing I've always loved about Longa is obviously Paddock's the benchmark. That's the other one I picked. You know, one of the best chronographs ever made, 5270, big size. But they are nothing like each other. No. And Longa never tried to be Paddock, even though that would have been the easy thing to do. Um, it was completely different design philosophy, feel, fit. I mean, it's like, you know, it's totally a different thing. And both are amazing. Yeah. And both use very similar styles of finishing, very similar levels of finishing. And it's, it's just so interesting to see how two brands using, you can argue the same tools and the same techniques have such their own DNA that's represented in their movements. And it, it's funny you say tools and techniques and one of the best things that I ever saw uh, when I was at Paddock, we got to go do a tour, we did a couple of group trips, and you go walking around and there's, again, older gentlemen, guys who've been doing this 30, 40 years, and there's a guy with a bench sitting there finishing parts, and there's a big hunk of wood on his desk. I know exactly and where I'm you're like, going. And I'm like, what's the deal? He's like, <laughs> well, he makes his own wheels that he uses to polish the parts. Yeah, that's awesome. And he makes them out of a piece of wood that comes out of a tree in his backyard. And it's the same tree he's been using for the last 35 years. He cuts a chunk and this is the way they designed this incredible. watch. It's like, incredible. this is the only way I can get this finish is from this tree and this wheel that I do by my so hand. So when he stops doing when it, stops, there will never gone. be another watch it's like gone. that. That's the beauty that's of, of the, these small towns, you know, the, these dial manufacturers being in small towns because, you know, You'll get the guy that's, oh yeah, I, I like to farm goats in my spare time. <laughs> oh, yeah, actually my house is right over there. He points out the window to his house and it's across the street. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like, so your, your entire life, your, you know, six days a week is spent between here and here. And it's like, yeah, and I love it. And that's, 
everything. Chances to me. are they haven't traveled before. Uh, you know, never n- left home. Not much out of not much. out of the. Thing. But yes. yeah, that that passion and that uh, you know, kind of the little things that make these watches what they are are incredible. I remember talking to Thierry Stern and Mr. Henry sitting there saying like, we've got these little manufacturers that there's one guy who makes this specific oil for them that they use about a quarter <laughs> year. And they pay for this guy's life because that's the stuff that they want in the consistency they want. And this guy makes it and his grandfather made it. And that's the way it's I love been. That. That's amazing. Love that stuff. That's what people forget when they just go to throw the watch on or they just go to take a look at it, you know, at, at the boutique. You know, that's that's the minutia that yeah. is behind There's the scenes so much minutia, that nobody right. acknowledges that's so special. The passion is in the people making everything that's in front of us. And that's really... I mean, you could wrap it up there, honestly. The passion is in the people. And, Correct. you know, a- anybody that you talk to industry-wide, yeah, you'll say, you'll say X brand does this really well, Y brand does this really well. But really, if you have... If you have passionate people behind your brand, you're going to have a successful brand. Yeah, you can see the hand of the man in the product, and that's what I love about all these brands. You know there's a guy over there who's doing his thing every day just to make that piece a certain way. 